Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, we'll be talking about highly politicized immigration issues both here and in Europe, and Brick's president on her 13 years at the helm. Hi and welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford. I'm joined in the studio by producer Ross Tuttle. Hello, Ashley. Hello, Ross. Hope you had a great Father's Day. I know you got all them kids at the house. I did have a good Father's Day, better than some mm -hmm. who are in detention, yeah. um, like the ones in New Jersey, mm -hmm. who were visited by some representatives, U.S. Congress members from these parts, mm -hmm. Hakeem Jeffries, Carolyn Maloney, Gerald Nadler, mm -hmm. um, some rock stars, a couple rock stars in there in my opinion, uh, who visited the Elizabeth Detention Center, Immigration Detention Center in New Jersey on a surprise visit to see some fathers who had come here seeking asylum were separated from their kids, as is the want now of the Trump administration, it seems. Let's mm -hmm. separate. I think, what are we now, up to 2,000, almost 2,000 2, kids? 2,000 is the last um, number I heard. I was watching uh, Gail on CBS News this mm -hmm. morning. Yes. <laughs> King. And one of the things that happened after that interview <laughs> was that people reached back out to Gail, mm -hmm. apparently. Um, from Border Patrol? From Border Patrol. Uh -huh. And they said, we are uncomfortable with the use of the word cages. But even if people are in cages, they're not being treated like mm -hmm. animals. Right. Which, to me, sounded like the most Dave Chappelle as Rick James explanation I had ever heard. Do you remember the Dave Chappelle when he plays Rick James? Or, and you know, Rick James has that quote, that mm -hmm. famous quote, where he says, you know, what I look like going into Eddie Murphy's house and stomping on his couch. Yeah, I went into Eddie Murphy's <laughs> house and stomped on his couch. So what? He's Eddie Murphy. He can afford a new couch. Like, that's what, like, that is the exact same response to me. It's saying, like, we don't like you using the word cages. <laughs> And yeah, they are cages, right. but people aren't being treated like animals. This is getting ridiculous. And I like the response in Twitter of a reporter, a nation reporter, who we're hoping to talk to later this week, who said, you know what's actually uncomfortable? Being in cages. Yes, yes. It just is insane. It is insane. It's wild. And it's, you know, it's pervade. It's this thing now. You know, I think the separating of families has been happening, obviously, for a long time here in America. People are just now starting to pay attention to mm. it. Um, I hate it when people act like that's an excuse for not doing something now, right. is the fact that it happened before. Mm -hmm. You know what? When things get brought to people's attention and they decide to act, I think that's something that as long as they do it with some education behind them and mm -hmm. as long as they are not you know, reinventing the wheel, as long as they're finding people who have already been working in this space, for a long time and taking care of it, mm -hmm. that we should support that. And we should say, yeah, go, you know better, you know now, so do better. Right. We should say, keep doing that, do better. And I think it's really unfortunate that we tend to go, well, why didn't you care about this three years ago? Mm -hmm. Who cares? Right. I don't care why somebody didn't care about something three years ago if they're going to do something about it today that's actually going to help move us forward. Well, here's a good point, a point that I'm going to take this for a little turn here because yeah, I wanted to Freak give, it, Ross. yeah, well, I mean, not such a turn, but mm. I wanted to shout out um, to uh, a tweet uh, from a friend who likes to remind people when they get sanctimonious about certain issues, which you're right. I mean, I think it's fine if something is going to energize us, but his tweet is, um, just a reminder, your local district attorney needlessly separates parents from kids, puts kids in cages every day in every city in America, often for the tiniest offenses. Mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. And we do need to be keeping that in mind right. as long as we are not using it as a deterrent to keep people from feeling empowered enough to do something today. I, I think there is a balance. And I think we're starting to figure that out in this country that we need a little bit more of that balance. Mm -hmm. And I guess if it's something like this that will enrage us enough, the question is, is this going to be the thing that sustains of movement? Are we yet outraged enough or are we just beleaguered? and exhausted because mm -hmm. every day it's just something new. How do you keep up? You know, when we try to book people on this show, when we try to talk about these issues, I'm conflating things like, okay, today I want to talk about DACA or was it the ACA? Because mm -hmm. you know, now the Justice Department says it's not going to um, 
going to fight the lawsuits against the Affordable Care Act, which is the law right. of the land, and they're not going to defend it in courts right. in certain cities where it's being where it's being uh, sued. Well, and it, or is it you know are we going to talk about these asylum cases? Are we going to talk about kids being separated from their families? Are we going to talk about Russia and the fact that we are seemingly doing their bidding at mm -hmm. the G7? It's just one thing after another. It and is one how, thing after and another. It, and you know and when, when can we talk about some lighter stuff? I mean, it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. Tell and me in the something meantime, light. I mean, you know, something light is that Jay Z and Beyonce just dropped a new album as the Carters, and it's not terrible. And people should probably listen to it and see how they feel about it for themselves. You should probably listen to it, Ross. I heard a little clip on the radio. Today. Did you? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'll play more for you later, mm -hmm. and I'll explain all of the slang to you that you don't necessarily understand. And I, I will look forward to that just like I'm happy to receive a song from you. I sent you the song of you Gri did. Grizzly Bear Michael McDonald. You did and the, that was a fantastic song as well. It's been out there for a little while and it's funny to listen to the original and then listen to Michael McDonald yeah. coming. It almost sounds like a little bit of parody you know kind of like. No. It's not parody. It's innovation it and it's innovation. fantastic. I guess the parody was in uh, 40 Year Old Virgin. Probably. Yeah. That's the parody. Coming up, Leslie Schultz is counting down the days before she steps down as BRICS president. And we'll hear about what she's leaving behind. So don't go away. I'm sitting in Brick House, which it's safe to say wouldn't be the great public space it is without the efforts of our next guest. After 13 illustrious years as president of BRIC, Leslie Schultz steps down this month. During her tenure, BRIC has been transformed from, quote, an umbrella for largely discreet arts and media programs in disparate locations into a leading high-impact institution in an award-winning new facility in downtown Brooklyn. That's what it says in the BRIC statement. But to tell us what that means to the community and to Brooklyn, we're joined by Leslie Schultz herself for the first time on 112BK. So happy to have you on, Leslie. It's so great to be here. Oh my goodness. Now, when you got here, Brick was known for Celebrate Brooklyn and Cable Access BCAP. What was your vision when you got here to change things and to unify things? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. I mean, we were also known for Rotunda Gallery, mm. which was a space for um, Brooklyn contemporary artists. Mm -hmm. um, for me, you know, although people saw these discrete things and maybe only knew one part of the elephant, mm -hmm. um, I saw some commonality and some, you know, common values and visions across the program. Right. It was all about Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. It was all about community. It was all about access to the arts and to media. Mm -hmm. And it was all about investing in artists and media makers. In every one of our programs, there was so much commonality. Right. The people here didn't quite know it yet. I think they knew their piece of it, but yeah. it seemed really evident to me. So you were able to see it. You had the vision. That's why they call you I guess so. <laughs> That's why they call you a visionary. How have you seen Brick evolve just over the years since you've been here? Well, we've grown a tremendous amount. Yeah. We were, um, we had, I think, um, about 35 employees when I got here, maybe 37, oh, wow. and now we have over 100 full-time employees. Wow. So that is really transformational. You go from being a small town to a small city. So yes. that's been really remarkable. And of course, you know, moving into this space has transformed us tremendously. Mm. You know, it used to be that people would say, I don't know, you know, what Brick is. I know about Celebrate Brooklyn. I know about BCAD. I know about Rotunda Gallery. Right. Not the same people, by the right. way. They would know their piece of it. But what is it? Why, why Brick? Mm -hmm. um, and now when people walk into this building, they get it. They see that we're a multidisciplinary organization, f welcoming, inclusive, mm -hmm. and um, you know, a place that really is together. Absolutely. And what was your hope for Brick when you got here? Like you arrived, and um, you had a lot on your plate mm -hmm. immediately, I'm sure. But immediately, like when you thought about what you wanted for this place, what you wanted to give as an expression of care to the community through this place? What was it? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I mean, I was given the charge of getting this building done. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, thankfully the board stuck with me as we took eight years to actually, <laughs> you know, get it started. No, more right. than eight years. No, eight years. Right. Um, and so that was one piece of it. I think there was a lot of tension in the workplace, to be really honest. Yeah. You know, I, I got here and 
you know, there were union negotiations going on. There were there was an EEOC complaint that landed on my desk on day one. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make this a place where the the sort of strife was dissipated and people were really had really come mm -hmm. together. And that, you know, and you know, in some ways, the place and coming together are really the same thing. We wanted a place for everyone, and we wanted to be a place where people could really work together with great confidence and love. I love that. I think this is a great place for collaboration. I think, you know, if there's one big lesson I've learned so far from being involved here at Brick, it is a lesson in collaboration and how to work with other people to create something that you're proud of. Mm -hmm. Which sort of makes me want to ask <coughs> you a two-parter question, which is what do you think is, like other people, like the community might see, people who didn't know you might see as your main achievement here at Brick, but what's your personal main achievement? as well, or are they the same thing? Um, I hope that the community sees that there is a place that, you know, that is for them, that mm -hmm. is Brooklyn's cultural living room or Brooklyn's backyard when you're out at the band shell, right. that is speaking to them, that is of them, that mm -hmm. we are of the community. Um, I don't know what the community thinks, but I hope that's, you know, part right. of it. One of the you know, amazing things I've seen grow here is the Interge Intergenerational Community Arts Council, is it, which is a project oh, yeah. that we've been in partnership with, um, with um, residents of NYCHA developments, mm -hmm. and watching that group actually curate their own program helps, you know, hope makes me hope that we're really sending a message that we are the community and the community is us. Yeah. In terms of my own achievement, I think, or my own vision, um, I think a real high point happened five or six months ago when our director of marketing, Jackie Montalvo, mm -hmm. um, had been working really hard to think about our institutional marketing campaign that goes along with our 40th anniversary. Brick is going to be 40 oh, yeah. this year. And she talked to lots and lots of people, and um, eventually she shared with us her synthesis of everything that she had heard, which is a, a, a line that I think you'll see a lot of, brick where Brooklyn comes together. Mm -hmm. And I think hearing that come from her, seeing the excitement on the board, seeing them sit up straight, seeing the senior team to respond to it, made me say, yes, my work is really done because everybody gets it now. You know, yeah. Coming back to your first question, everybody gets that we are, you know, we're working in different disciplines, but we're all trying to do the same things. I love that. I love that. That's cohesion. Now, when you walk in here on a daily basis, what do you see? Just walking, walk through that door, go to your desk, like, what do you see here at Brick House? Who do you see? Well, I see family. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, I sort of, I, I know just about everyone, not everyone anymore. You know, right. you know I, I went away for five and a half weeks last summer, and they did a lot of hiring, and I was like, Wait a minute, who are these folks? Um, but I do, you know, I, I think there's a real sense of connection. So there's that piece of it. Mm -hmm. I see people sitting in this room getting ready for today's 112BK. I see, you know, fantastic art to discover. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I see a warmth and energy and, you know, good coffee. Good coffee. There you <laughs> Very go. Very important. Very important. And how do you see Brick? How do you see Brick relative to its importance to Brooklyn in general? Mm. Because to be perfectly honest, you know, until Brick reached out to me, I didn't know that Brick was here. And now that I do, all I see is potential. Like that's all I see here at Brick. It's just like, oh, there's still, like as amazing as things are right now, as far as I can see, it like it just, I see how far they can go too, mm -hmm. like, and I love that about this place. This place is like potential in just one spot here on the corner in Fulton. Right. But how does that play into what Brooklyn needs? Well, I think Brooklyn could use a number of more brick houses. I don't mm -hmm. know that the next president is going to take it in that direction, mm -hmm. and I'll be interested in seeing what he or she does. Um, one thing we realize is that, you know, there is, there's no such thing really as Brooklyn in some ways because yeah. there are so many different communities here. Oh, there yeah. are, you know, dozens and dozens of Brooklyn and um, of Brooklyn's, and so it's really important for us to not just be down here and so whether we 
build other facilities or not, and that's not that's not on the table. Right. Um, it's really important that we continue our program with the Brooklyn Public Library mm -hmm. and that we stay in five branches. It's really important that you know we continue to work with communities, you know, geographically dispersed throughout the borough, and that we go to them and not just expect people to come to us. The school work that we do, the educational programming mm -hmm. in 40 Brooklyn public schools gets us out into the community. So I think that's really crucial to really continue to reach out. I think so too. What's next for you, Leslie? Um, not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, I sort of thought the most appropriate thing for me to do after a very busy 13 years here is mm -hmm. to spend eight hours going to theater on the day after I leave. So um, my first day off is Wednesday, June 27th. I'll be in the audience for Angels in America, okay. part one and part two. Oh. And then my, my last day is also the day of the New York State primary. Mm. And I am going to work on a campaign for somebody who is trying to make change in America come mm. November. Fantastic. So and then I'll see what I'm going to be up to in January. And then we'll see what you're up to in January. Thank you so much for being here, Leslie. I can't tell you enough. Like, it has been amazing seeing you here, and I'm sure for quite a few people, it will you know, be sad to see you go. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, a conversation with two filmmakers who have brick ties. On the occasion of the HBO premiere of their documentary about the refugee crisis and asylum in Europe. Here's a brief preview. They stop the boats to call help. The boat flips 180 degrees. My cousin Binyam and his brother, that's all of them, they are died. I get out of the bay in the morning, and I know I'm not going to go to the bay. It's a terrible thing. We're going to go. You can't understand that we are prisoners or privileges. Today, the U.S. president tweeted about immigration in Europe and the challenges Angela Merkel is facing politically because of the influx of refugees into her country. He wrote, crime in Germany is way up, which isn't true. Big mistake made all over Europe in allowing millions of people in who have so strongly and violently changed their culture. We don't want what is happening with immigration in Europe to happen with us. To get a bit of insight into what's been happening across the Atlantic, we're joined by the producer-director team of the film It Will Be Chaos, premiering tonight on HBO, which documents the struggles of refugees trying to find safe harbor in Europe. Lorena Luciano, co-producer and director, welcome to 112 BK, and Filippo Piscopo, co-producer and director and frequent Brick TV contributor. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, so uh, give us the basics. How did you get involved in this story, and what are the main storylines you followed? Luciana, can we start with you? We started in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, truth w is that we were actually, I was still editing and finishing a documentary we've done together, a previous feature, full American story of water contamination in the coal fields of West Virginia. He was working as a producer for hire on a feature documentary, ironically enough, on the border between Mexico and the United States on mm -hmm. migration crossings. And both of us, we would, you know, be on the phone mm, watching the news and seeing uh, southern Italy, and especially the tiny island of Lampedusa. This was, this was the height of the Arab Spring. Uh, the tiny island of Lampedusa being, you know, um, fortunately washed right. with, you know, thousands and thousands of people that they were crossing the Mediterranean trying to reach uh, Europe because Lampedusa is a small tiny island, is an entry gate to, to Europe. So, of right. course, 
our reaction was, and at that point, we had lived in the United States mm -hmm. for 15 years, but both were born and raised in Italy. We, we, we felt the urge that we had to go, and uh, we right. wanted to go back to Italy. And what we wanted to tell at the very beginning, because the images that we would see on the, mm, on the news was, uh, were images of so many boats mm -hmm. uh, with this you know, human cargo of people stranded uh, at sea. And then the next image would be uh, th this migrants being unloaded on the docks of Lampedusa from, yes. and, then, and then that was the end of the chapter. And mm -hmm. this was the repetition of images. So our first idea was, what comes next? Let's go and find the story and tell that, that story. It's, mm -hmm. you know, what comes to these people once they land, once they survive the crossing, what happens next? What's the next chapter? I think that's what a lot of people wonder, Lorena, and it's something that you guys go into in this film um, so wonderfully, at least what I've seen from the trailer so far. But, Filippo, I'm wondering, as the refugee crisis continues, and it is continuing, and it will continue for some time, I believe, um, are we seeing attitudes shift in Europe uh, there, uh, as far as people's feelings about immigrants? In, in what way are they shifting? It's a uh, it's, um, loaded question. At the same time, it's true. Um, and w that's wha what we wanted to focus on. We realized that the story we needed to tell was the, the tale of two stories. On one side, the refugees landing on our home country, Italy. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, the story of the locals mm -hmm. who are impacted by the migration phenomenon. And uh, we documented uh, a story in particular where the Italians were helping, were welcoming people, were uh, trying to manage the crisis. And right. the locals oftentimes were left to fend up by, by themselves mm. in many local situations that we followed. Our film is kind of a road trip to it, through Italy and through Europe. On one side, following the refugees in their quest for a safe place and for freedom. And on the other hand, the local people and their reaction mm -hmm. to the migration and the refugee phenomenon. Of course, on one side there are, and the, and the local people were split oftentimes between compassion and animosity. So there were people who were saving mm -hmm. and rescuing the migrants drowning into the Mediterranean Sea on one side. And on the other hand, as the phenomenon got bigger and bigger since we started working on this film, people also started to flip on the other side and, and to complain about this huge number of refugees, which is actually not a huge number. We learned when we went there and we started talking to the humanitarian organizations because you have to consider that only 15% of the displaced people run and try to get to Europe and the right. Western world. The right. rest, the, the, 80, the remaining 85% are people who are actually staying in the border countries in right. Africa or the Middle East. Absolutely, absolutely. And there was one small town Italian mayor in the film who we meet who was voted out of office. Lorena, did that have anything to do with the shifting attitudes toward immigration? that the mayor ended up being voted out? Of course. Yeah. Of course, because uh, the propaganda is always a tsunami mm. of migrants arriving on, in the, to the Western world and taking away resources and money and, and right. jobs. And uh, as you said, people, people are scared. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that um, the very big problem is that there is no migration policy in place. Mm -hmm. Not from the local point of view, not from the national, not from the European point of view, not from a global perspective. We mm -hmm. keep investing money in building walls and right. borders. We mm -hmm. keep investing money in, you know, uh, the militarization mm -hmm. uh, to use, you know. And, uh, and, and this way we think that when we build borders, problems, they go away. Is but that they why don't. this prime minister got voted in, do you think? 
because he's very he's a very far right prime minister. Filippo, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yes, that's one reason. The other reason is that unfortunately the political parties on the on the right and the populist parties, one of them is the one who's governing Italy now. They use they simplify the topic mm -hmm. of refugees and migration. First of all. Uh, putting together the, the migrants and the refugees and not making a, a distinction. And on the other hand, they're, of course, um, uh, using the fear of the local people or the you know, people living in Italy right. in order to advocate for right. a policy which is similar to the one that Trump uh, used as his narrative. Mm -hmm. Thousands, millions of people are invading our country. We have to do something. We have oh, to yeah. close the borders. And the situation is not different from uh, Arizona, from Lampedusa, because in Arizona they die of dehydration. Ooh. Talk to me about this. I want to I wanna hear more about this, Filippo, because what you've witnessed in Europe, I feel like both of you, I feel like must give you a unique perspective about what's happening with Mexico today and here. Is, I mean, is that what you're when you talk about Arizona, when you talk and people dying of D? I mean, it's yes, not I mean, that different. No, and I mean the the situation is is different, but the the main issue is the same. Again, in Arizona, people um, the migrants die of dehydration while they try to cross the border. Right. In Lampedusa, they drown. And in fact, the first scene of our c uh, film, uh, we decided to start with that scene. Mm -hmm. It's a very intense, uh, emotionally and a very intense scene. We. Um, flew into Lampedusa right after one of the worst shipwrecks in the history of Italian migration and European migration where 367 people died and because a boat full of migrants capsized only one mile from the island of Lampedusa. So imagine yourself landing in the epicenter of the migration crisis in Europe with hundreds of people uh, from Eritrea coming to the island from the diaspora, the European diaspora, and trying to figure out if their loved ones were still alive or they, die, they had died in right. the shipwreck. Right. So a scene of pain and anguish at the point that I myself as a cinematographer, not only director, at a certain point after hours witnessing this pain and anguish of people who did find their loved ones and figure out that they were dead, uh, I had to sit down and cry for at least 20 minutes, half an hour, mm -hmm. because the pain was too big. It was difficult to contain this pain. And this is, the, you know, the thing of being a documentary filmmaker, how do you draw the line between the need of telling your story on one side mm -hmm. and also the need to respect the people who are Absolutely. going through such an immense pain. Absolutely. It sounds like it's going to be a brilliant film. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait for more people to see it. Thank you both so much for being here and for talking about this with us. Thank you. Thank you. The film, It Will Be Chaos, is available now on HBO Go, HBO Now, and On Demand. And that's the show for today. Tomorrow, as the World Cup continues, we'll be back to talk about corruption at FIFA that was investigated and prosecuted right here in Brooklyn. We'll also talk about the state's lawsuit against the Trump Foundation and getting kids and adults to dance and dream in Crown Heights. Hope you can join us. Mm -hmm.